Alors on commence, bonjour, je vais faire une petite introduction en français parce qu'il y a beaucoup de francophones quand même dans la salle et je passerai ensuite euh, la parole à mon collègue européen et espagnol pour, pour présenter les orateurs. Donc je suis physicienne, enfin je suis clinicienne, pardon, voilà le défaut, et, euh, et je suis très heureuse d'être là et euh, de pouvoir parler. Vous avez vu dans le programme, il y a une première partie traitement et demain une seconde partie traitement et donc de pouvoir parler avec nos éminents orateurs euh, des nouvelles drogues, des stratégies 2014, que ce soit en naïf ou en switch. Voilà. Donc, euh, je passe la parole à M. Gattel, éminent collègue. Bonjour tout le monde, enchanté d'être ici à Marseille, une année de, de pluie. Et il sera un plaisir d'être euh, ici avec vous pendant la, la, la prochaine année et demie. So for the for this session, the, the first three talks is about uh, some reviewers. The, the first one is uh, Trip Gulick. Trip Gulick works in New York. is one of the person that has been involved in the development of most of the antiretrovirals and most of the strategies. And his talk is going to be about how, how we wanted to deal with the challenges uh, Mark put uh, on the table in the previous talk. Trip, thank you for being here. So thanks to Alain and the organizers for inviting me over. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about new antiretroviral drugs. I serve as a co-investigator for some industry-sponsored studies at my home institution. There are a number of compounds that are in the development pipeline in all of the current classes, and in addition, newer classes of antiretroviral drugs. In the interest of time, I'll pick five of these to highlight as the drugs that are either the farthest along in development or the ones that offer the most promise over drugs we have today. What do we need in a new nucleoside? I think you'd agree that less toxicity and perhaps activity against resistant viral strains are the top priorities in this class. The candidate agent is a prodrug of tenofovir. So as everyone knows, the, drugs that we, the drug that we use today, TDF, is a prodrug that is broken down into tenofovir. An alternative investigational prodrug is known as TAF, or tenofovir alafenamide Fumarate. These two prodrugs have significant difference that is uh, illustrated on this slide. So the TDF formulation that we use today is swallowed and then converted into tenofovir in the plasma, then enters the lymphoid cells and is phosphorylated to the active compound tenofovir diphosphate. In contrast, the investigational prodrug TAF enters the plasma and remains in the form of the prodrug and is only converted from TAF to the active compound tenofovir and then phosphorylated inside the cells. Why is that important? Well, first of all, the antiviral activity of the new formulation TAF, as illustrated in this 10-day monotherapy study that was published last year, in 36 treatment-naive patients, with viral load levels at least 2,000 and CD4s over 200. As one can see here, looking at the change in viral load, there was a placebo group, the TDF group, and then three doses of the new formulation TAF. Looking at the change in viral load, one can see that TAF was associated with three quarters to approximately one log drop in viral load levels, compared with about a half a log with the current TDF. So this short study illustrates the virologic activity of the new formulation TAF. In that same study was the important drug level differences between the two. On the left, we're looking at the active compound 
tenofovir diphosphate in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Obviously, this is where we would like the drug to be concentrated. This is where HIV replication is occurring. And one can see t TDF, the current formulation, in blue at the, at the uh, recommended dose of 300 milligrams. But the uh, doses of TAF tested showed that that compound achieves levels of tenofovir diphosphate one to 20 times higher than the TDF formulation. And then when one looks in the plasma, again, the blue line showing TDF uh, concentrations of the active compound tenofovir, one sees that these are 10 to 100 times higher than the TAF formulation. So more active drug inside the cells where HIV replication is occurring, but less of the compound in the plasma which may well be related to its toxicity on end organs, in particular the kidney and the bone. This is the phase two data looking at TAF that was presented by Paul Sachs at last year's ICAC conference. The study population were treatment naive with viral load levels of at least 5,000 and CD4s above 50. And as you can see, 170 patients were randomized to one of two options. As shown here, the abbreviations, everyone received FTC L-Vitegravir boosted by Cobacistat. And then the randomization was either to the current form of prodrug of tenofovir, TDF, shown in orange, or the investigational formulation, TAF, shown in blue. We're looking at the proportion suppressed to less than 50 copies out to week 48. And you can see the lines are virtually overlapping with about 90% of all patients suppressing their viral load levels below 50. Similarly, the CD4 increases were approximately 200 cells in both groups. So comparatively, TAF performing similarly to TDF in combination. What about the toxicity? Up top is shown the change in estimated uh, creatinine clearance, or uh, GFR, glomerular filtration rate. And you can see in blue, the TAF formulation is associated with less of a reduction in glomerular filtration compared with the TDF formulation shown in orange. And this did reach statistical significance. Down below is bone mineral density as measured by DEXA scan. On the left is the spine, on the right is the hip, but you see similar trends Again, TAF in blue showing less of a, a decrease in bone mineral density compared with, in orange, the TDF formulation. Again, reaching statistical significance both in the spine and the hip. So less of a decrease in renal function and less bone mineral density loss with the newer preparation. This has supported moving forward to a phase three program, which is designed exactly like the phase two study I just showed you. For treatment naive patients, viral loads at least 1,000. And you can see large studies, um, over 800 patients to be randomized in two studies. So these will be the registrational studies for TAF. And once again, it's an L-Vitegravir quad with either the TDF formulation we have today or the TAF um, and note that it is placebo controlled. What are the status of these phase three studies? They're fully enrolled and we anticipate the results. Moving to non-nucleosides, what do we need in this class? Well, less toxicity and better tolerability, activity against NNRTI resistant viral strains, and fewer drug interactions would all be attractive qualities. The investigational drug in this class that's farthest along in development used to be called MK1439 and now has a name. It's Dorabirine. So this is an investigational NNRTI, potent at low milligram dose. It's not a CYP450 inhibitor or inducer, so potentially fewer drug-drug interactions than other NNRTIs we have today. However, it is metabolized by CYP3A4. Importantly, in the test tube, active against viral strains with important resistance mutations, such as K103N, Y181C, and E138K. And even combinations of these important NNRTI mutations, Doravirine retains susceptibility, at least in the test tube. 
Pharmacokinetic-wise, ritonavir does boost the levels of this drug by a factor of about three. This was the phase 1B study, the first time tested in HIV-infected people. Uh, this was uh, presented at the CROI meeting last year in 2013. It's a small study, but was double-blind, randomized, and placebo-controlled. The study population were HIV-infected, treatment-naive, and you can see a very small 18 patients were, were uh, randomized between one of three options. In green is placebo, in red, dorovirine at 25 milligrams once a day, and in purple, dorovirine at 200 milligrams once a day. And this was a short study of only seven days. We're looking at the change from baseline and viral load, and as you can see, the two active arms with dorovirine were associated with about a 1.5 log decrease in viral load level. This supported moving forward with the phase two study that was presented at the CROI conference this past year, a much larger study of treatment-naive patients. Over 200 patients were randomized between one of five arms as illustrated. All received tenofovir and FTC, and then randomization among four doses of dorovirine versus efavirenz as the third drug. Shown in the, the uh, figure here is the percent of viral load levels suppressed to less than 40 copies at week 24 in each of the five arms. And as you can see, all five doses of dorovirine were associated with about a 76% um, rate of suppression to less than 40 copies, similar to the 64% rate seen with the favorins over on the right-hand side. What was different was the toxicity, and one can see two important toxicities that were less common with dorovirine than efavirenz. Dizziness occurred in 4% on dorovirine versus 24% on efavirenz. Nightmares, 1 versus 10%. Based on these data, the 100 milligram dose of dorovirine was selected to move forward into phase three testing. So again, we look forward to those results. What do we need in a new integrase inhibitor? Well, once daily dosing, dosing without a pharmacokinetic booster would be an attractive quality and activity against resistant viral strains. Dolutegravir fulfills both these criteria. That's a recently approved drug, and it has a close cousin known as GSK1265744, which I'll simply call 744. So structurally, it's related to dolutegravir and has a similar resistance pattern. It has potent antiviral activity, as shown at last year's EX conference in HIV-infected individuals at the doses tested of 10, 30, and 60 milligrams orally. Well, if it's so similar to dolutegravir, do we really need something exactly like it? Well, the difference here is that using a nanotechnology formulation, that 744 can be given as either subcutaneous or intramuscular injections. And this compound has an exceedingly long half-life of 21 to 50 days. Here's a pharmacokinetic study after a single injection of 744. And note the time course here. This is on the order of weeks. So after one single injection of this compound at a multiple different doses, one can see that you can still detect levels of the compound even as long as a year after that dosing. Then if you draw a line at the protein-adjusted 90% inhibitory concentration, you can see many of the doses continue to be detected, and so this compound could be dosed as infrequently as once every three months and still achieve target concentrations. That sets it aside from all the other compounds that we have to use today. So certainly supports quarterly dosing. In terms of safety on these initial PK studies, injection site reactions occurred, although quite different from the ones that we saw in the past with infubertide, and uh, there were some nodules with subcutaneous dosing. This drug has been tried at both in treatment and prevention. The prevention occurred in a PrEP study in monkeys that was presented at last year's CROI. They looked at 16 male macaques and they were randomized either to injections of 744 or a matching placebo and then challenged with a shiv rectal challenge. Um, as you can see in the figure, 
Note that the placebo group all were infected after the SHIV challenges within about eight weeks after the first challenge versus the 744 group shown in blue where none of the monkeys were infected. So in this model, 744 was an effective preventative. This was uh, accompanied by a vaginal challenge experiment that was uh, talked about at this year's CROI. Again, 12 macaques received injections with either 744 or placebo, then challenged vaginally with the SHIV strain. Um, and all of the monkeys that received 744 remained negative after the challenges. All the placebo monkeys were infected. This was presented as a late breaker at this year's CROI. When they increased the dose of SHIV by a factor of five, as shown in the figure here, again, all the placebo monkeys were infected quite rapidly. A few of the 744 monkeys were also infected. Further studies in man now are commencing to look at 744 as a preventative in humans. As you may know, uh, we don't, of course, we don't like to use one drug at a time in HIV. Real piverine might be matched with 744 because this approved drug has a long acting preparation that can also be dosed at least or, or around once a month. So might you combine these two together? The first clinical trial of combining these two together was presented at the IAS meeting last year. So this was a phase one pilot study, randomized repeat dose escalation, importantly with an oral lead-in. So if we're giving a compound that can stick around for months, one would like to know that there are no initial side effects. So using the oral preparation first may help rule that out. Uh, this was in 47 HIV negative individuals they received different dosing schemes of the 744 LAP is long acting preparation intramuscularly with a monthly dose of ropivirine long acting given, given subcutaneously. The endpoints were safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics, and they concluded that this combination was generally safe and well tolerated with grade one injection site reactions or ISR the most common side effect. And importantly, target drug levels were achieved. At this year's CROI, we heard of a combination study to use 744 as treatment. Note in this study called the LATTE-1, oral 744 and oral rolpivirine, that combination were tested. So this was a phase 2B study in treatment naive HIV infected people, and you can see over 240 were randomized among four options. In three of the options, uh, I should say all people received two nukes, and then in three of the arms, one of three doses of 744, and the comparator was two nukes and a favorins. At 24 weeks, they made a switch, and they switched in rilpivirine 25 milligrams, the standard dose, and switched out the nucleosides. So this is a novel maintenance regimen using the integrase inhibitor 744 and the non-nucleoside rilpivirine. And I, again, I want to remind you, these are oral doses of these two drugs. Here, we're, I'm speeding up, Jose, okay. Uh, the, uh, here is the results of the suppression rates below 50, and you can see that the 744 arms achieved almost a 90% suppression rate, similar to the efavirenz rate. Importantly, when they switch to a rilpivirine and 744 maintenance therapy, all or almost all of the patients continue to suppress their viral loads below detection. And so this would substantiate that this is an important regimen which could lead to virologic suppression. The follow-up study, LATTE2, will use oral versions of these two drugs, but then switch to IM dosing. So the goal here would be to have an all IM treatment regimen for HIV-infected individuals. What do we need in a CD4 attachment inhibitor? Well, that's a class we don't have today, so a novel mechanism of action is important to have. BMS663068 is an oral small molecule HIV attachment inhibitor. In this small phase one study with multiple doses, one can see that using this compound, 
led to about a 1.5 log drop in virus. So that shows the, demonstrates clearly the antiviral activity of this compound. However, there was a decrease in baseline susceptibility in some patients due to envelope polymorphisms in GP120. This may require screening of this compound uh, to determine an IC50 based on the patient's GP120. Of these 48 subjects in the study I just showed you, 42 subjects had a nice virologic response. Six had no response at all. They were completely resistant without ever having taken the drug before. And further population sequencing led uh, the investigators to show that one of two polymorphisms or substitutions led to decrease activity of the compound. This phase one study led to a phase two study that was presented at this year's CROI. Um, and this uh, treatment experience patients uh, who had susceptibility at baseline to the compound were randomized to one of four doses of 068 or adizanavir, ritonavir, and importantly, the backbone was tenofovir and raltegravir. What they showed with eight days of monotherapy was that the CD4 attachment inhibitor, again, led to a 1.5 log suppression um, of viral load level. And continuing the combination through week 24, you can see between about 70 and 80% of patients were suppressed, and that was similar to the adizanavir backbone. There was no difference in side effects between, and no patient discontinued 068 for side effects. What do we need in a new CCR5 antagonist? Well, the one we have today is twice daily, so once a day would be helpful. The other thing is, could you also inhibit CCR2, which is a receptor sitting on macrophages that mediates inflammation? So potential anti-inflammatory properties would be of interest. So the last drug I'll cover is Sinicroviroc. That is a compound that antagonizes both CCR5 and CCR2. In this monotherapy study, one can see that doses of Sinicroviroc led to an up to 1.5 log decrease in viral load. And the phase two study, uh, which looked at uh, triple drug regimens of tenofovir and FTC with either sinicroviroc or the control of the fabrins, showed that about 80% or 70 to 80% in all groups suppressed below detection. So it did show durable antiviral activity in patients with documented R5 virus. What about inflammatory markers? Well, soluble CD14 is one of those. You can see that in efavirenz, the levels continue to increase over the course of the study. In the sinicroviroc arms, those decreased to week 24, but interestingly rebounded after that. So the anti-inflammatory property of this compound um, remains of question. Last slide is to show that sinicroviroc is moving forward in phase three a higher milligram dose. They're going to co-formulate with 3TC in one pill, as shown for you here. And the design of the study is tenofovir FTC versus sinicroviroc 3TC with a third agent. So sinicroviroc is replacing tenofovir. And there are single tablet regimens under development. So that's taking a look at the five compounds that are farthest along in development. And thanks for your attention. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions and we should go to the next presentation. Please try to stay within uh, 15 minutes. We have four presentations and one hour from now on. So, Mark, back to the present. What are the first line agents? Thank you, Jose. I I'm not going to stay within 15 minutes because me and Chip went and checked and they said we had 20 minutes. So, uh, But I'll do my best for you. Um, so I think the, the, the fact is it's all good news. I think when you come to these conferences and hear doctors speak, it's often about criticism of drugs, criticism about regimens. I think when we come and look at first-line therapy, um, if my slides work, the, we have a really wide choice of drugs to choose from. And the fact is that when we put those drugs together in combinations, and there are various different clinical trials exploring X against Y, A against B, the fact is that they work. If you look at the results of clinical trials nowadays in naive patients, it's around 90% achieving undetectable viral load, and in the correct 
clinical environment, it's exactly the same. So don't let people tell you that's a clinical trial. In clinical practice, we should be achieving exactly the same. And because of this wide variety of drugs, because of this long-term success, beginning drugs is just the beginning of a very long road for the patient, a very long road, which basically means a normal lifespan, hopefully, and so we need to get it right. Certainly, we can look at guidelines. If you look at various guidelines out there, uh, they're all very, very slightly different. But if you look at the most free, uh, recent guidelines coming from the DHHS, uh, it's really got everything in it because we've got everything uh, is working very well. You can see what their recommendations are. And in future, I think you're going to have guidelines saying this is what you should not do rather than what you should do, because there is a wide choice of what is correct in the naive patient. The big difference that I've seen, and one of the mistakes that we're making, is, is that often we're forgetting about the patient. You know, it's all about uh, trust from the patient, which is a good thing for the doctor. Patients, when I first started, who were starting therapy, would come in and say, I've read this, I've read that, now it's about, I trust you, you're the doctor, you choose. So we shouldn't be just looking at guidelines, we should be looking at the data, we need to look at the various different drugs, looking to see whether there are different in efficacy, not just about getting the viral load undetectable, but durability of response, looking at immunological response as well. Clearly, we can look at differences in toxicity between drugs, remembering that with time, time has come back to bite us with these drugs with long-term toxicities. And if you look at the time it has taken us to actually recognize long-term toxicities, sometimes it's a bit of a disgrace. If you look at AZT, 12 years to recognize that drug was associated with lipoatrophy, just as one example. Clearly, we need to think about adherence in our patients. We need to think about drug resistance and what happens when patients do fail. We need to think about drug-drug interactions, and we need to think about cost. And unfortunately, in naive patients, there's going to be a greater and greater move, not towards cost effectiveness, but how much drugs cost uh, uh, when patients actually start. Forget the ideas of cost effectiveness. Buyers aren't going to be interested in that. So if you look at your naive patient, up to now, a favorance has always been the kind of fallback position. I think we're aware now that there are issues with a favorance. I think the argument over fetal toxicity really is over. But increasing awareness of CNS toxicity and the potential for a favorance to be associated with other factors, potentially with lipoatrophy as well. And of course, CNS toxicity has always been the limiting factor, and we're all aware that when patients start treatment, efavirenz may be associated with CNS toxicity. But again, important to be aware that most patients will come off because of long-lasting CNS toxicity. Data from our unit and from other units has shown over 80% of patients will stop a favorance for CNS toxicity after the first 12 weeks of therapy. And that, I suppose, association with long-term toxicity and the availability of multiple other easy and efficacious drugs has led to other regimens outperforming efavirenz. So if we look at various clinical studies, you can see that the comparator appearing to do better than efavirenz, and that's important to know that that is driven by CNS toxicity. The other issue all over the world with non-nucleosides is the increasing prevalence of non-nucleoside resistance. You can see in this study from Gilead actually just looking at non-nucleoside toxicity in their studies of non-nucleoside resistance in their studies over time, you can see this increase. And if you go to countries like Taiwan, it's now running at around 16%. So that's going to be another factor that comes in against using a non-nucleoside up front. So if we're not going to use a non-nucleoside, what can we use? Most guidelines are looking towards integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, and this very good study from America, large study from the ACTG, of course, compared ritonavir, atazanavir, raltegravir, and ritonavir, darunavir in patients commencing therapy. 
around about 2,000 patients, so a very large study. What did that study show? It showed no difference in virological failure between the three arms. It showed that protease inhibitors, particularly atazanavir, was associated with tolerability failure. If you put those together, virological and tolerability failure, the integrase inhibitor outperforming the protease inhibitor. But careful, if you look at this graph on the left, if we think about this as in clinical practice, i.e., if patient A develops a toxicity and is allowed to change to a different regimen, it didn't matter what you actually started. So as Christine Katlama put it to me the other day, uh, the ACTG spent uh, several million dollars showing that atazanavir caused jaundice and patients didn't like it. And of course, there are side effects with every drug. So if we look at those agents, there are disadvantages. Atazanavir with jaundice, increasing recognition of renal stones, darunavir, mostly because of the ritonavir associated with diarrhea and drug-drug interactions. Many parts of the world still using Kaletra with all the toxicities associated with that. And even with raltegravir, we have the disadvantage potentially of twice daily dosing and some recognition of toxicity now with the DRESS syndrome and myositis. So what do we have in its place? Well, we have several other drugs available to us. We have the quad tablet of Stribald. Again, studies in naive patients against a tripler. We have the results, the results of that study showing no difference in virological non-suppression. So you could say that's slightly disappointing if we've said that drugs are now expected to actually beat a favorance, but a trend in favor of the Stribald. Again, against atazanavir in naive patients who are against a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor. Again, a trend in, in favor of Stribald, but no difference in virological non-suppression. We also have the disadvantage of the changes in creatinine. You'll all be aware this isn't due to renal toxicity. It's due to changes in the uh, tubular receptor pumps, cobicystat blocking mate 2 giving this rise in creatinine, which is not a reflection of renal dysfunction. But of course, that causes confusion if we're giving a drug such as tenofovir as well. The other issue, and I think major disadvantage of the quad tablet, is when patients do fail, and remember it's small numbers of patients in these studies, they do develop integrase resistance, and they also develop nucleoside resistance. And we're all aware that FDC is supposed to protect you against the M184V, but in this study, a large number of patients with failure, which reflects a small number of patients overall, did develop this mutation. What about dolotegravir? Well, Mark Weinberg's already shown you uh, these studies. We have the single study where dolotegravir was superior to efavirenz, but remember that's being driven by CNS toxicity, not virological failure. Dolotegravir was superior to ritonavir, darunavir, again, mostly driven by toxicity, and dolotegravir was equal to raltegravir. So dolotegravir appears to be highly effective and have some advantages over existing agents. Mark's shown you the data on dolotegravir uh, and resistance, and you can see within studies no integrase resistance. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that Mark is now retiring. There is absolutely no way in clinical practice with the mixture of patients, the mixture of virus, the mixture of doctors giving these drugs out, that we will not see resistance to dolotegravir in the future. The other important thing is to remember that treatment has always been a partnership. And it's not just about the third drug, it's also about your nucleoside backbone. And there have been studies which have helped us choose nucleoside backbones. This really good study from the ACTG looking at Travada versus Kyvexa in combination with either a non-nucleoside or a protease inhibitor really taught us several messages, including the fact that we need to look at patients where they are being, where the drugs are being stressed with high viral load, low CD4 count to really look at 
differences between drugs. This study, as you're all aware, showed an advantage at high viral load, both as regards virological failure and a safety endpoint in favor of Truvada over Kyvexa. If we look at patients with a viral load below 100,000, and remember, this viral load cutoff is completely artificial. It's a completely artificial cutoff. But here we see no difference in virological success between the arms. Other studies haven't shown that. So if we look at this study, the HEAT study, Kyvexa versus Truvada with a protease inhibitor, no difference between Kyvexa and Truvada, both at low and at high viral load. So is Truvada actually a more potent drug than Kyvexa? Well, the way to look at that is to look at your early virological fall, your fall in viral load. And if we look at viral load fall within the first four weeks, we see no difference between Kyvexa and Truvada. So what's driving the difference is likely to be the fact that Truvada is a more forgiving drug than Kyvexa. When the patients make mistakes, what is happening is they're much more likely to develop resistance with the Kyvexa arm than with the Truvada arm. My belief, it all comes down to forgiveness. And to back that up, and whether this actually matters in clinical practice, let me show you some clinical data. If you look in clinical practice, whether Kyvexa and Truvada have the same potency, this is the UK sheet data, they work exactly the same. I'll show you some cohort data now, and I could show you data from the UK, I could show you data from Europe, I'll show you data from Canada, mostly because I've got the slides actually and I haven't got the other slides, but low and high viral load, Kyvexa versus Truvada, no difference in time to virological suppression, no difference in time to switching antiretrovirals, no time difference in time to switching nucleosides, no difference in time to virological failure. Why is that? In clinical trials, you're seeing patients every month. They're being told off when they're not adherent. They're being phoned up when they don't come back to, 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 to uh, the study visit, and therefore we're able to stop the non-adherence early. Clinical practice, we're seeing patients every six months. When they don't turn up, I go and have a cup of tea. They get very little support about adherence, and therefore that advantage of the Truvada disappears in clinical practice. Clearly with nucleosides as well and nucleotides, there are still disadvantages. Tripp has told you tenofovir and renal dysfunction, bone mineral density changes, a bacovir associated with a hypersensitivity reaction with an association with heart disease. Cohort studies such as DAD still carry on to show a bacovir being associated with myocardial infarction, although studies, clinical studies, show no association. But the cohorts still strongly show an association of a bacovir with cardiac disease. So with all these problems with nucleosides, nucleotides, one other option is to get rid of the nucleosides completely. This very interesting study of 3TC and Kalitra, and we said, you know, Kalitra is not in any of the Western guidelines, re really, apart from the EAX guidelines a little bit, I suppose. But this is a study of Kalitra and Lamivudine versus Kalitra, Lamivudine, or FTC with another, non another nucleoside of the investigator's choice. Two drugs versus three drugs two drugs not associated with any difference in virological failure, but actually being safer and therefore giving higher rates of success, although not significant, than the triple regimen. We've also seen this study from the NEAT cohort, protease inhibitor, ritonavir, darunavir, and raltegravir, two highly potent drugs given together against triple therapy, a composite endpoint, complicated endpoint, virological failure, clinical endpoints, but a great endpoint because it actually reflects clinical practice showing no difference overall between the two arms. But again, beware, you need to look at the data, look at where the drug is stressed. At high viral load, a strong trend towards the double arm underperforming, and certainly at low CD4 count, the double therapy underperforming. So the dual therapy 
really argument is a bit actually weak, I think. I think we need to carry on with triple therapy. The big change, as I said, is going to come from cost and around patents. Patents have been around for years. Don't think patents are new. Henry VI gave the first patent for the stained glass windows uh, at King's College, so no one else could make uh, stained glass in the United Kingdom for 20 years. Exactly the same with drugs. They've got a patent life expectancy, and you can see many of the drugs which we use within our guidelines are coming to the end of their patent uh, 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 expiration. And you can see when we argue against a tripler, are we just jumping on a bandwagon driven by the fact that, men, that the drugs within a tripler are all about to come off patent? Does it really matter splitting those drugs from one tablet into three tablets? This is some data from our unit, actually looking at virological success, and you can see it didn't matter whether the patient was taking one tablet, two tablets, or three tablets. They all worked incredibly well with very, very low rates of development of resistance. So I know the patients may prefer to take one tablet once a day, but the data is really not there to say that it is necessary to actually achieve virological success. And this is data from a country where they were told you must split a tripler into the composite parts, and they showed that there was no difference in virological success over that year. This actually goes down. This is actually percent virological failing. And if anything, the rates of virological failure went down. And that use of generics, yep, yeah, I'm going to finish. The use of generics is going to be really important because of the potential cost savings. This is a modeling which actually modeled in. It's not the patients would actually live shorter, but they modeled in a loss of life of 0.37 quality years of life. And per patient, you could save $42,500. If generics are priced at 75% reduction, that means your savings would be $920 million. And don't think you can't make those savings. Don't think there won't be a three quarters price reduction because if you look at other successful drugs coming off patent, that is what the drug reduction has been. So in conclusion, we have lots of drugs available to us. Unfortunately, or fortunately in some cases, the patient is putting the trust in the doctor. But beware. This is data looking at what healthcare professionals think is important for patients. And you can see efficacy, low toxicity, CD4 count rise, and then all this once daily dosing, single tablet regimen, etc. If you ask the patients, it's rather different. They want a regimen that works. They want a regimen with low toxicity. They want a regimen that protects others, which unfortunately is near the bottom for healthcare professionals. All the single tablet regimen, low tablet load, once daily dosing, is actually at the bottom. That doesn't mean patients don't want it, but what is important is that we don't sacrifice all of the hype over this and mean, meaning that patients will actually lose the advantages of the high efficacy, low toxicity, which we have available for us. So although the patients trust us, it is important that we trust our patients. Our job is to explain the advantages and disadvantages of starting treatment, the advantages and disadvantages of each and every regimen, and allowing the patient to make an informed decision. Thank you. Th thank you, thank you, Mark. I'm, I, I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. We are a little bit behind the schedule, but I'm sure the speakers will be here in the floor at the end of the session and will be available if someone of you will have questions or doubts or comments or, or whatever. So, next presentation is Danny about uh, switching treatment. Danny, it's one colleague from uh, Barcelona, and he also has been involved in many strategic trials in the development of antiretroviral drugs. Thank you, bonjour, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks to Dr. Lafayette Alain for uh, inviting me to this meeting. Let me say before beginning that the boss had given us 20 minutes, but I will try to do the best. So uh, today I will talk about uh, switch strategies in antiretroviral therapy, uh, sometimes called also a simplification, although not always uh, switching implies to simplify treatment. These are my conflict of interest. 
Uh, despite great advances in HIV therapy, mainly in the, main, uh, in the last 10-15 uh, years, uh, with a sharp decrease in morbidity and mortality, a reduction in toxicities as well as in pill burden, there are still several important limitations of art, such as toxicities, difficulties in long-term adherence, drug-drug interactions, not only with antiretroviral drugs, but also with uh, many of the uh, other uh, drugs taken by HIV-infected patients in the uh, context of uh, morbidity, comorbidities and aging, and finally cost. Uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy is fortunately being expanded, uh, is uh, initiated earlier than uh, previously according to recent guidelines, and there are also some uh, prevention strategies, but all of this is occurring in a context of a worldwide economic crisis, so cost really matters, and not only in the uh, poor world, but also, although the situation is difficult, is, uh, so it's different in uh, developed countries. So switch strategies are a big tool, or may be a big tool, in the management of HIV infection with the aim of maintaining virologic suppression while optimizing art in terms of short and long-term durability and convenience. And this may help to reduce toxicities, to improve adherence, to improve quality of life, and finally, to the long-term success of art. I'm not talking about a new strategy. Actually, 15 years ago, in the sixth edition of the Retrovirus Conference, several papers uh, were presented regarding switching strategies, in that case, trying to reverse lipodystrophy and uh, metabolic disturbances in patients receiving a first-generation protease inhibitor. Uh, and despite, uh, during many years, most of these studies were uh, conducted by European investigators, actually not only in the European, but also in the American guidelines, a switch strategy is uh, recommended at least for selected uh, patients, for selected situations. But let me say you that, that uh, also that there are some potential risks of switching, such as viral rebound. So we should take into account potency and genetic barrier of the new drugs, history of biologic failure and resistance, also food restriction, which may impair adherence to the new drugs. Second, unexpected or unnoticed drug-drug interactions, as I have commented, with antiretroviral, but with other drugs. And finally, uh, patient disappointment due to uh, the presence of new toxicities or even improvement of, uh, or no improvement of previous uh, toxicities, such as lipodystrophy, as you know, is very difficult to be reversed. The old, uh, NEFA Spanish trial published more than one decade ago in New England Journal of Medicine was a good example of an increase in the virologic failure in a patient switch to a drug or to a regimen with cross resistant to previously taken drugs. So uh, the message here is that we should take into account many uh, or several important points before deciding to switch therapy uh, of a successful regimen. Well, these are uh, Dr. Gates and me a long time ago when this uh, study was being planning and the metabolic sub-study, but we look really the same. So, uh, from uh, which regimen to which uh, may we switch? Uh, this is like a market. We have a lot of, uh, of options here uh, to be uh, chosen from uh, coming from a PI, a non-nucleoside, a nucleoside analog, an integrase inhibitor to many of these other uh, options, and also from a triple uh, therapy to uh, alternative regimens with less number of drugs just to preserve future options, reducing toxicity or uh, both. So I would like now to briefly uh, summarize the results of many of the main clinical trials in which uh, uh, switching strategies prescribed in clinical practice are based on. As uh, probably uh, uh, most of you know these uh, studies, I will only highlight a couple of points from each of them. So beginning from sw with switching from a PI, the ATASIP study showed the benefit of uh, switching a, a triple BID regimen, uh, including a lopinavir, to a more convenient uh, once daily regimen containing atazanavir, ritonavir, maintaining viral suppression and improving uh, lipid profile. In fact, most or almost all of the studies switching from a PI show a benefit in terms of lipid or uh, metabolic changes, and this is very important mainly in patients with high cardiovascular risk. In the same uh, way, the SWAN study showed uh, the uh, or switch uh, boosted or unboosted uh, uh, protease uh, inhibitor regimen to unboosted atazanavir, uh, uh, here uh, even improving the viral response and also showing uh, a benefit in uh, lipid uh, profile. 
and in more recent studies such as the Assure or the Aries here, uh, they confirm the results or the good results with atazanavir and boosted atazanavir combined with avacavir and 3TC, in this case coming from a regimen of boosted atazanavir. And uh, again, a, a decrease in lipid parameter was observed, and in this case also uh, a decrease in hyperbilirubinemia that, as you know, and has been uh, clearly shown recently in the ACTG 5257 uh, is the main uh, limitation of boosted atazanavir regimens. Uh, several studies such as the NEFA and others have shown some years ago, uh, again, that uh, we can switch from a, a protease inhibitor to a non nucleus a first generation non nucleoside such as a fabulous or a virapine obtaining uh, good results in terms of metabolic uh, changes. And more recently, uh, and published this year, the, the SPIRAT study showed the same strategy but switching to a second generation non nucleoside regimen such as rilpivirin, again with good uh, data in terms of viral response and again uh, in uh, lipid parameters with the advantage of being one pill to be given once a day. Uh, what about integrase, uh, integrase inhibitors? Uh, in this case, the story is a bit more controversial because uh, the SwitchMAR studies published in Lancet could not show the non inferiority of switching from Calitra to Raltegravir in pretreated patients with uh, previous virologic failures. Uh, however, the spiral study showed the non inferiority of switching from API to uh, Raltegravir. Probably uh, one of the main differences be between both studies was the longer time of previous virologic suppression in the spiral study, which required at least six months, uh, uh, in contrast to only three months in the SwitchMAR studies. And in the spiral study, uh, there was uh, the, the, pe the uh, period of previous virologic suppression was of uh, six years of median, while this data was not provided in the SwitchMAR study, although probably was a shorter period of time. Anyway, uh, both studies show an impressive improvement in, uh, in the lipid uh, profile, in, uh, including the spiral substudy data such as hapolipoproteins or uh, uh, LDL subfractions. And also, uh, 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 it was observed a decrease in pro-inflammatory markers such as uh, hypersensitive uh, 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 RC, uh, CRP or MCP1, among others. And I think uh, in a context of uh, comorbidities where inflammation seems to play a key role, it would be, it would be very interesting to know the, the long-term clinical relevance, if any, in terms of morbidity or mortality uh, after switching to a regimen with anti-inflammatory properties. Okay, with new available options, we have uh, 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 new possibilities of, of switching, and the strategy study uh, uh, presented at the last CROI show again a switch from API or from different boosted PI to the new integrase inhibitor combination of LV Tegravir, Covistat, and Truvada, the Stribel. Uh, it should be noted that the population enrolled here was at, at a less advanced stage of disease than the uh, Raltegravir studies without previous virologic failure and uh, patients being in the first or second line of therapy. And in this study, uh, Stribel was uh, shown to be superior to continue with a, a, a boosted uh, PI, although this difference was only observed when comparing separated with atazanavir, but not with Calitra or darunavir. So the, this simple one pill per day regimen was associated with good viral response and a significant decrease in lipids, but also a decrease in estimated glomerular filtrate rate, which, as you know, is a, a, an effect of a COVID that. Okay, up to now switching from API, we can also switch from a first generation uh, non nucleoside such as fabirans, which is associated uh, with the central nervous system toxicities, to a second generation non nucleoside such as etravirin. And these and other studies have shown uh, uh, the, the benefit in terms of reducing this annoying uh, toxicity uh, with this strategy. And uh, also, the second part of the strategy study uh, published or presented at the last call showed again. Uh, that you can switch if you have, a, you, you can pay it uh, one pill from a triple to one pill of tribal just to decrease CNS symptoms, and again, you will observe a decrease in AGFR. What about nucleoside analogs? The ABCD, as well as many other studies, have shown uh, several years ago that timid analogs, mainly D4T, was associated, was clearly associated with the presence of lipotrophy, and several studies have shown some benefit uh, after switching from uh, D4T. 
uh, to uh, non-TB analogs such as abacavir or many denofovir in terms of some gain in lymph fat and uh, a decrease in metabolic disturbances. You can also switch from a, a non timine to another non timine uh, uh, analog, such as Truba, uh, mainly Truvada to KVEX, as has been uh, uh, observed in the Assure study uh, presented a couple of, of years ago, but uh, uh, published uh, last week with uh, good results in terms of reducing uh, renal uh, and bone parameters, as again, taking into account comorbidities such as hypertension or diabetes which may impair renal function, this may be of help for uh, some patients. Okay, we can switch from a triple to a triple regimen, but we can also try to switch to a regimen with less number of drugs. Unfortunately, the, the <coughs> PI monotherapy story is a bit controversial, uh, both with Calitra and with uh, Darunavir, as uh, the different studies have shown some increase in, uh, uh, to a low level viral replication in uh, monotherapy arms of these studies compared with triple arms. Here you can see the blue areas. For example, in the monitor trial uh, evaluating uh, the Darunavir monotherapy, uh, non-inferiority at 96 weeks could all only be demonstrated if restoration of uh, nucleoside analogs in patients with viral rebound was not considered a failure but a part of a strategy. So the message here is that we should select very well patients who may benefit from uh, monotherapy in, uh, in if you use it in a clinical practice and strict adherence is a, a key point. Uh, and, but these limitations of uh, this strategy may explain the differences in criteria of uh, panel experts. Uh, while the European guidelines do, uh, recommend this strategy at least in selected patients, the US guidelines do not recommend boosted PA monotherapy outside from clinical trials. So we can also switch, try to switch to dual uh, therapy regimens. Let me highlight here two points. Although most of the studies, at least up to now, have been performed or conducted in uh, naive populations, uh, probably uh, the role of this strategy, if any, will be in a switching scenario or after a first biology failure. And second, some of these regimens have uh, shown a good performance, but others have failed uh, with biology failure or toxicities or both. Uh, for example, uh, a regimen of Calitra plus Raltegravir in the PROGRESS study showed uh, good results in terms of viral efficacy, but uh, the Spartan study uh, uh, evaluating a regimen of ata unboosted atazanavir plus Raltegravir uh, was discontinued prematurely because a high uh, 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 increase in toxicity and also of uh, selection uh, uh, to re of resistance to Raltegravir. Mark has commented the striking results of, uh, of the uh, uh, Gardel uh, study uh, with uh, combining 3TC and Calitra in naive population, which was uh, published recently by Pedro Khan from Argentina. That's why the name Gardel, you know, is a tango singer from Argentina. And the same regimen is being uh, evaluated in a switching scenario. Uh, uh, this is the old study with this name only can be a Spanish study, although French investigators are also participating, and is led by Dr. Gatina and Arribas, and data are uh, soon coming. And very similarly, in the SAL study, uh, again in a switching uh, population, 3TC plus atazanavir ritonavir is being evaluated. Preliminary results have been presented in the last AACS, and uh, uh, we are waiting for the final uh, results. Most of the uh, studies of dual therapies have included a protease inhibitor, a drug with high genetic barrier, but there are a few examples uh, not including uh, API uh, and with discordant results. These two small non-comparative studies suggest that a combination of raltegravir plus etravirid may work at least according to their preliminary uh, data in terms of viral response. So obviously we need more data in contrast uh, the, the group uh, from France, from Christine Catlama, showed disappointing data with the combination of Raltegravir plus Maraviroc uh, with a high uh, 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 virologic failure, uh, the appearance of resistance to Raltegravir in some cases, and even a shift to uh, of tropism in a couple of cases. So just to go to, to move to the last but not the least point with only two slides. Uh, this is the, the, the cost of the therapy, just to, in this first slide, to, to show you, as you know, the, 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 the important differences 
in the price of the different regimens being the, uh, the cheapest, uh, those using a generic, a third generic drug or uh, PI monotherapy in the middle regimens uh, using uh, a non-nucleoside uh, drug and uh, the most expensive uh, are those including uh, an integrase inhibitor or a protease uh, inhibitor uh, and being even more expensive if is, uh, Truvada is used as a nucleoside backbone instead of a Kybexa. And very interestingly, our friends and colleagues from uh, another hospital from Barcelona uh, presented this data uh, with a proactive switch uh, uh, in, their, in their clinical practice uh, in a proportion of patients just trying to lower the cost of uh, the treatment. And they did so in 16% of uh, a cohort of 2,400 patients. And they could save near 1 million euros in one year uh, with this clinical data. 84% of patients continue with, with the same regimen. Only 2% presented virologic failure and less than 7% uh, had to change due to new toxicities. Here is the, 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 the list of the different switches they did. The most frequent was Truvada 2 Kbexa and the most cost-saving triple therapy 2 uh, monotherapy. So let me uh, conclude by saying that switching strategies may help to improve adherence, tolerability, and long-term success of ART. There are currently many switch strategy options which allow to reduce number of pills, of doses, and of drugs with considerable benefit. However, risk and limitations of switching should be carefully taken into consideration, such as viral rebound, drug-drug interactions, or new toxicities. Not all switching strategies used in clinical practice have been assessed in well-powered randomized clinical trials and may not be the best options uh, for certain patients, or at, at least we should need more data. And finally, using strict inclusion criteria to ensure adequate safety and efficacy, switching strategies may be used to generate significant cost savings. Thank you very much. We'll skip the questions to the final of the session and then uh, I'll give the floor to Isabel for the two abstracts. Yes, uh, thank you Roy, Mark and Daniel in a short time to, to give us some strategy and hope for the future and new family, new formulation. Yes. Now we have a little half an hour to, for two works. The first one is very um, biologic works. It's about ultra deep sequencing and it's a, a Marseille uh, study. It's a Marseille study, yes. And the other one uh, is more strategy. And now, uh, Sofiane? Yes, Sofiane. For clinical impact of ultra deep versus sequencing uh, for minority mutation on HIV 1. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank uh, the scientific committee to give me the opportunity to present my uh, work. So, we know before uh, treatment, we have some pre-existing resistant associated and they cannot be detected by the Sanger sequencing. So I show you one example was published in hepatology. The author shows that this uh, resistant associated variant are present above 2.8% and they can increase with the virical failure. So the question is how can we detect this mutation. It will depend, it will depend of the detection, of the method of the detection. So there, um, for, for example, Sanger sequencing, we have a 15 to 20 percent of sensitivity. For pyro sequencing, above 10 percent. And finally, for ultra deep sequencing, above 1 percent. So in this presentation, I will uh, explain what is the clinical position of this cutoff. There are several methods we can, we can, uh, we can um, detect this minor variant, but today we will focus on the ultra deep pyro sequencing, which has a good sensitivity, 
with equipment cost and interpretation problems. So the first experience was to use pyro sequencing by Pyromark from Kagen. In this study, we, um, we detected some NRTI mutation in 10 patients at two, at two points, baseline and biological failure. So I give you one example of uh, patients at baseline and virgical failure. We were able to detect minority mutation at 17% at baseline, and the same mutation were detected at virgical failure. These mutations were not detected by the Sanger sequencing ba uh, in, uh, in baseline. So now I'm going to talk about the ultra deep sequencing. The first aim of the study was to evaluate UDS on Jess Jr. for the detection and quantification of minor and major variants on protease and reverse trans transcriptase, HIV-1 genotype A, B, C, and G. And the second aim was to evaluate a simplified analysis interpretation of a drug resistant using software JeepCheck. With uh, this uh, software, we are able to compare Sanger se sequencing and UDS at two sensitivity levels, one and 20%. And finally, we were able to compare the, um, the interpretation of the three most frequently uh, free uh, algorithm, French databases, HIV databases, and REGA. What about the patient and method? This is was a retrospective study. We used 50 uh, HIV patients with a virological failure. Two methods were used, Sanger sequencing and UDS. For the data analysis, we used Viroscore for uh, Sanger data and the Jeep check for UDS data. The first result was uh, about the genotype who had a concordance, a total concordance between the two methods for the genotype. And now I'm going to talk about the UDS workflow. In this table, we can see all steps for the UDS protocol. We have 64% uh, for laboratory waiting and 36 for laboratory ending. At least it, um, it takes 34 hours to give one result whereas only 10 hours for Sanger protocol, but with 9% of interpretation. So is it why we wanted to use an easier uh, software to improve and accelerate the interpretation drug resistance? Why? Because too much information kills information. So in this slide, we can see the, the data with the Jeep check uh, software, we were able to compare several factors like um, the, the method, Sanger and UDS 1% and UDS 20%. And after we were able to compare the three most frequently algorithm used, ANRS, Stanford databases, and REGA. As we see, we have more reveal relevant mutation for the UDS 1%. And if you see the drug, the, the another drug classes like NRTI and PI, we have the same result. The most relevant information is the difference between the, the algorithm, like you can see here. After that, we wanted to know which mutations were responsible for the drug resistant interpretation difference. I give you one example for efavirenz drugs. If you use French ANRS uh, algorithm with the mutation Y181C, you have resistant interpretation. But if you use HIV databases with the same mutation, we will reduce the susceptibility of the resistance. But if you use REGA algorithm, three mutations are needed to have a resistant interpretation. 
We noted that the Y181C and T215Y mutation were the most responsible, were the most uh, associated interpretation difference. According to this result, it is important to, defini to define minor and major discrepancies. So minor is intermediate interpretation versus susceptible or resistant result. Major is susceptible result versus resistant result. So if you see the number of major and minor discrepancies, you have a major, you have a significant difference for major discrepancies. How about the HIV databases? We have a significant dif difference, uh, significant difference for minor discrepancies. And finally, if you see the Rega algorithm, you have a significant difference for both classes. So, to conclude, Uh, our result shows that the sensitivity of detection of minor mutation impact on drug resistance between algorithm with important therapeutic consequences. And UDS methods need to be complemented with a sample and highly performant software. And finally, of course, this result should be validated on large multi center. So this Uh, study was published uh, recently in the ads. Thank you for that. We have just uh, the time for one question. Just a, I have one. Uh, in, in terms of clinical practice, we are, it is already time for ultra deep sequencing, jumping to the clinical practice, or is it still a, an investigational tool? In Sorry, your opinion? can you repeat? Uh, it's not, um, how can I say, um, the, um, the lab waiting and the lab uh, handling, it, the lab wait, uh, waiting and the lab uh, handling is very, very long because we have uh, 34 hours to give one result and uh, it's laborious. Uh, laborious experiment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we, um, we have the pleasure to have a, a Belgian. Thing. Uh, it's monsieur, it's uh, Mr. Nathan Klumex. Who speak? Uh, We, we, we can speak first line therapy, lopinavir versus nevirapine, and to an MRTI in developing countries. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to present the results of the, this trial which was performed in uh, Lubumbashi in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The results of the 98 has been already published, but here we have the 144 weeks results. So the background, and uh, this background is per particularly relevant when we look at the mistakes made in the past. The background is that WHO recommends one NLTI and two NLTIs as first-line regimen in a resource-limited setting, and most important, this choice is made based on cost and also on facility, but cost is one of the major points. And boosted PI as second-line regimen. And in this setting of uh, resource limited uh, situation, an LTI based regimen may result in emergence of more HIV drug resistant just because there is a low genetic barrier. And as I said, the results of the 96 uh, study has been presented at the CROI and recently published in AIDS. And this result show that there are more virological failure and more drug resistant mutation among patients on and heavy wrapping. So we hypothesis in uh, 2007 that a PI-based regimen may be preferred to standard WHO regimen just because the situation in this source-limited setting are such that P 
patient will uh, not take in their medication as they should, or there will be problem in uh, giving the medication to the pharmacy from the, to the, from the pharmacy to the patient. And we also take the opportunity to look at the backbone and comparing Zydovidin 3TC and Tenofovi FTC, which was uh, not yet at that moment the first shot for WHO. For those who don't know, uh, Congo is a big country, uh, Central Africa, and Lumumbashi is just, if I read here, is on the soft part of this big country. It's a multi-center trial, five center around and one lab which has been uh, set up. So the study design was to, uh, to have a first randomization with lopinavir uh, versus, busalopinavir versus uh, NATI versus uh, nevirapine and a second randomization between tenofovir FTC and zidovidin 3 tc The primary endpoint, and I, I think that's very important, are the WHO primary endpoint for failure, and at that time, uh, it was not yet the level of 1,000 copy defining the failure, it was 5,000 and 10,000, but we chose 1,000 copy as the definition of virological failure. And this point is important because in all the trial performed in developed country, the definition of failure is more than 50 copies. But I think uh, for resource limited setting, it's more relevant to take 1,000 copies. The subject disposition, we, we selected 724 patients, around 300 were excluded. 425 underwent randomization, and after one, uh, 44 weeks, we still have uh, 103 in page, uh, 13 in one arm and 136. I think it's important to, to show that only few patients were lost to follow up. The baseline characteristic are those of uh, resource limited setting trial with a majority of uh, participants were women, and uh, only two of them were exposed to single nevirapine dose before entering the trial. Most of the patients were in a severe stage. The CD4 is far less than the 500 copy, uh, the 500 level, uh, which is proposed now, because 164 uh, was the medium for uh, nevirapine and 168. Plasma viral load was very high, and most of the patients were infected with a clay C. Here are the results of primary endpoint intention to treat. As you can see, the difference in clinical endpoint were not significant between the two arms, and what which was very significant was the virological failure, 70.7. Uh, percent in the nevirapine arm and 9.3 in the lopinavir boosted arm, which is was highly significant. And when we make the total of the uh, endpoint, the difference was also significant. And this was an intention to treat uh, analysis. The Kaplan-Meier of the virological failure show clearly that the d after 24 weeks, the two group diverge. As a secondary endpoint, we have also the CD4 median change from baseline, which indicate, has already shown in other trials, that the PI uh, arm uh, the, uh, goes better with the CD4 increase, 251 versus 174, which is highly significant after week 144. The most important point is to compare the virological results and drug resist appearance of drug resistant mutation. And as you can see, all the patients in the 88% uh, of the patient in the nevirapine arm develop resistant to NNATI. And most important, they also develop resistant to NLTI. And among them, I think it's noteworthy that around 26% of the patient develop a K65R. In contrast, in the lopinavir arm, 
no resistant to PI and only few resistant to NLTI and no K60 field R. Concerning adherence, there was no difference between the true group of patients. All patients have the same adherence and patient in virological failure also. Meaning that when the patient is failing, it's not because uh, a difference in adherence, it's only because the patients who stop his therapy with an LTI develop resistance, which is not the case of PI. And that's the definition of genetic barrier, of course. Safety analysis show that there were more side effects in the lopinavir arm, but this side effect doesn't uh, lead to in treatment interruption. There was no difference in treatment interruption between both arms. And as expected, there were a rash in the nevirapine arm and a GI side effect in the uh, boosted lopinavir. When you compare the backbone, there were significantly more side effects in the Zydovidin 3TC than in the Tenofovir FTC. And also more side effects which lead to study drug discontinuation. And as expected, most of the side effects were nausea and neutropenia for Zydovidin. So in conclusion, in a resource-limited setting after 148 weeks, a follow-up and an LTI, an LTI first line regimen is associated with more virological failure, more drug resistant mutation, and a lower immunological response than a PI based regimen. I think these re results are particularly relevant in some African countries where there are important gaps in services delivery and program performance that contribute to suboptimal adherence, substandard antiretroviral regimen, and acquired drug resistance. So we could say that in such setting, a boosted PI strategy could be a better first-line option. Of note, this strategy is recommended in all guidelines in developed countries when baseline genotypic analysis is not available. Of course, such strategy should be evaluated, but I think that the main message is not that the PI are better. The main message is that a high genetic barrier strategy is probably better in a developing country than the low uh, 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 genetic barrier strategy, which is actually the first start in this country. Thank you very much. So thank you. Is there any questions from the, the floor? Just, Nathan, do you think that, the, I mean, the, these results are driven uh, because uh, it's nevirapine, or, or you, uh, you are extrapolating the conclusions to all low genetic barrier drugs? No, I don't see, I don't see uh, this result specifically for nevirapine. I think uh, this research would happen with any, uh, any compound which has a low genetic barrier if you are in condition where the drug supply is interrupted or whatever. I think the, it's a question really, I'm really convinced it's a question of a genetic barrier. So any questions from the floor? So if not, thank you, Nathan, and okay. on behalf of uh, my co-chair Isabel, and uh, thank you for, for being here, for participating in the session, and thank you also to the, the three speakers and the two abstract presenters for for the information they have shared with us.